Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor. If you have a mom, you'll love our podcast. Here are your hosts, former Fox News political correspondent, Joel Waldman, and his mom, Carmela, a licensed marriage therapist and Holocaust survivor. Carm? Yeah? I don't know what it is, but the anxiety level from 1 to 10 is at like a 37 this past week. I'm, I tell you, word of an, honor, you inherited this from your father. I don't suffer from anxiety. I had an episode of pericarditis in D.C. Everyone said it was from reporting. I'm back reporting. I feel Wait like a second. I can feel Wait my heart lining starting to get inflamed. Wait a second. You had the pericarditis 10 years ago. And I have two things when, I wanted to share that I haven't shared because I'm afraid to share, but I'm going to do it live on this podcast. Oh, my God. I, I hate this. <laughs> I'm not playing this like that. All right. So, number one. No, don't do this. I finish. Number one, I finish. Uh, I can't even think straight. I finish. Uh, I finish. Work uh, every night when I finish my eleven o'clock hit, you call me within three seconds. I could, I don't know, be in the middle of gunfire, and you're like, Joel, hey, you're, and I'm like, there's gun gunshots being fired here, <laughs> and uh, anyway, you told me what did you tell me last night, two nights ago? What was the first thing you said to me? That you're per- you were perfect. No, uh, other than that, about my professionalism. Oh, I didn't like your shirt? Yes. He <laughs> said, Jared, don't wear a T-shirt. Don't wear By the way, if you knew how much that shirt cost, you'd be pissed. But that's a linen shirt, which is nice. Well, why don't you put a sign on it, like like about here in big letters, like like AOC did it with the, so the tax the, the, very, rich. the very next morning, I didn't tell you this, the very <laughs> next morning, I noticed yesterday you wore one with the collar. I got a text from my news director. <laughs> <laughs> and the text said, please wear shirts with collars. What? And I swear to you, this wasn't, did you and tell her? And that is what I think has triggered my really crazy anxiety. That and what I'm about to tell you in a moment, which you're going to get pissed about. But Oh, God. I was so happy at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> so... I've now this told, is so funny. But to I cannot me, not stand to the world. people telling me how to look and act. At 52, I have no tolerance. So now I've got to be a little, you know what, and wear a shirt with a collar. Because mommy and the director and said the director, so. And apparently, and part of the problem is I don't know my stories half the time because we don't go to a newsroom anymore until I'm right, on the road. Stop quetching. Okay, go to the second one. Time is of essence. Second one is my beloved friend Michael Littman and I will be traveling to Las Vegas next week for UFC see? 266 or 267 to see my boy Nick Diaz. I think God bless you and God bless America. Bugs was supposed to get, go with me, my wife, but she's now a working girl. So Littman is filling in. Okay, Littman. Okay, you don't sleep in the same bed with Littman. Littman that... We're going to go out for dessert after I got him octagon no, side seats. No, no, seats. because he I was sleeping in a single bed with got, you because it's... I he already asked that. I told him, no way. <laughs> he got I got octagon seats that I paid for. Usually I get them through... <laughs> Press credentials. Okay, and then I'm going to get. A, this is, I'm going to get a three dollar. No I'm going to get a three dollar milkshake with Lipman, and he's going to ask me for a buck fifty in Vegas. He's going to ask me for I, a buck fifty. I don't 50 want to discuss Lipman. It, it's a waste of my life. We've got a super guest for the main schmooze coming up. His name is Brian Cuban. He's got a little known brother, but Brian is the man, and we're going to talk to him about the interesting life he has led. We'll be right back with the main schmooze. Do you want to help my son? His company, Content Partners Media, specializes in brand video and content creation for innovative companies and others. Please go to www.contentpartnersmedia.com and hire him. I repeat, please go to www contentpartnersmedia.com Welcome back 
to Surviving the Survivor. It's time now for the main schmooze. Carm, you know, I think this is our uh, main schmooze guest number 33. And this one came about in uh, sort of an interesting way. Um, I got a follow on Twitter from the great Brian Cuban. And uh, and then we spoke via direct message. And uh, he told me he has a new book out. He has a brother that you probably heard of, but that's not important for right now. And uh, I told you about it, and and you thought he was uh, an interesting guest to speak to, correct? Correct. I uh, and I also felt flattered in your name uh, because in your name I felt flattered that you were picked up on the internet. Picked up on the internet, yes. Brian, how are you? Thank you for picking me up on the internet. I am doing very well. Thanks for uh, corresponding with me through the internet. Yeah, it's awesome. So let's tell the audience a little bit about you. Brian Cuban is an attorney, an author, a speaker, and an activist. And uh, most of all, a sweet guy, prim primarily because he's from, do you know where, Carm? Pittsburgh. Your your friend, Barbara Glitzer, may she I rest in peace. I have a positive peace. prejudice for positive prejudice. Positive, right? You, you, what, yeah. was, what was the name of the Glitzer's uh, pharmacy there? I don't know. It. I think it was. Anyway, I don't know. She had a, a very close friend from Pittsburgh, and the family had a prominent pharmacy. No, but which I'm what sure was also very interesting is that I do. I did go to another wedding for somebody else. Carm, we didn't start the uh, interview I know, yet. but I have to tell you that <laughs> Pittsburgh is like a one. The, all the people were fabulous. Salt of the earth. So. Yeah. Brian Cuban is an authority on a variety of things, including male eating disorders, which we're going to get to, drug addiction, alcoholism, as well as rehabilitation. He's also a lawyer and an activist in areas of the First Amendment, as well as hate speech. He has a brother who works for a show about marine life or sharks or, or something like that. I okay. think it's called leave it, leave it, leave it there. <laughs> leave it there. Forget about the brother. So, Brian, how, he, how you doing, Brian? I'm doing well, thanks. I bet that wedding was in Squirrel Hill. Squirrel Hill, I, d I don't know, but that was that was Sarah Mendelssohn's wedding. Okay, doesn't matter. So, Brian, you have first off, and most importantly, you've got a book out called "The Ambulance Chaser," which is an interesting title. For full disclosure, my wife's father was an ambulance chaser as well, <laughs> and he did quite well. But tell us, what's the book about? It's about a, a Pittsburgh personal injury lawyer by the name of Jason Feldman, who finds himself accused of the murder of a high school classmate uh, from 30 years prior after her remains are discovered. And he is arrested, jailed, and he uh, goes on the run and becomes a fugitive to find the one person who can prove his innocence and save the life of his abducted son. This is fiction, correct? This is a novel? This is fiction, yes. This okay. is not an autobiography. <laughs> so, I have never been accused of murder, at least, <laughs> at least not yet. So let me ask you this. Um, I'm interested in this because I, I write occasionally. I've gotten really into comedy in recent years. But how, how did you develop the storyline? Well, the storyline started actually from a dream, okay? I, I've, I, have two memor I have two books that are set out of by, uh, memoir type. You can only tell your story so many times, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, the book started with a dream, a reoccurring dream that I have of uh, being a young boy in Pittsburgh close to my home and throwing bodies into a fire. And then the dream flash forwards to me as an adult Worrying if I'm going to be or worrying that I'm going to be arrested for all these bodies I threw into a fire. Bodies and I'm standing bodies, bodies. Oh, bodies. And <laughs> I'm standing and I'm standing next to my childhood best friend, uh -huh. throwing the and we're watching these bodies burn. And I and their eyes are and it's I mean it's grisly, right? Uh -huh. And their eyes are all open staring at us. That's how it started. Carmela, you're that, the therapist. Would you that, like to jump that in here? That was an inspiration. <laughs> I wonder if this dream started around the time when you were researching your long time, like your grandfather's uh, non mentioned in the family, but uh, that he, your grandfather lost a sibling in Europe and so forth. And then you really went all out. I have to compliment you. You really made a valiant effort to find out more about this photograph that you found after your uh, grandfather's death, right? 
So I'm think I'm linking in my mind. I'm projecting it into you, but I'm I'm linking in my mind that event. You know, with these bodies, because um, Brian, just for a little background, I I screamed at Carmela a couple of weeks back for being a diva, which she is, and not doing enough homework on our guests. So what she's trying to do right now <laughs> is show off and show that she's read everything about. Is that right, Carm? I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea I'm what you're impressed. talking about. Explain. What What are you talking no, about? No, that Brian Brian was doing all sorts of different things, and somehow a photograph popped up. Mm -hmm. And on the photograph was a young family, but you could tell it was in Europe with two children, mother and father. And he said, who is this? And the, somebody in the family, I forget who said, we don't talk, we didn't talk about this, but this was grandpa's, grandpa had two brothers, right? And they- He had, uh, he had two brothers and a sister. But the sister is the one who stayed in Europe. The sister was the one who was murdered, stayed and was murdered. Yes. Carmen, you could write the Cuban family tree. So, so <laughs> yeah. this, this is, where was your family? Where, where was this family? They in, were in where? Poland. Some. Uh, no, not Noa Salita, Romania. Ru Romania, Romania, yes, Romania. Yeah. It's when, uh, back in those days you were either being persecuted by the Russians or by the, uh, Romanians, right? Cause they kept switching back and forth <laughs> during the war. And uh, the Romanians swept through, the Romanian army swept through and murdered everyone, all the Jews in the town. So, so when did you discover, you just, you discovered no, this No, but photo? he didn't just discover it. He didn't walk into his lap. He really, you really had to make a very valiant effort, a real, uh, and, and go out of your way and get in touch with some distant relatives who well, had... let's, let's let Brian tell the story since it's his story. <laughs> oh, yes, I, I had a picture of my, uh, of my great aunt Frida, uh, Frida Sternberg. And, uh, and her husband and children. and But all it said was murdered on the back in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. It was in Yiddish. And uh, so I decided that I was going to figure this out. And it took me over, uh, over a year of just creating a family tree. And it was very cathartic in many different ways. And I ended up reconnecting with my relatives in Israel, who we went and saw in November, which was uh, before, right the November before the, uh, before the uh, pandemic hit. And uh, I connected with a relative in Boston for one of the brothers who I really didn't know. I only knew my grandfather, not his and siblings. So they had the same postcard uh, that had the names of everyone on the back. So they sent me that. And with those names, I was able to go into the Yad Vashem da database and find the testimonies, uh, translate the addresses and who left the testimonies. And it led to reconnecting with all of my extended family and identifying them. That's interesting. Out of curiosity, I'd be too lazy to do that. What, what, uh, I don't know, what, what engendered this? What made you want to kind of solve the puzzle? Uh, I, the Holocaust is just very personal to me. And I've always, uh, I mean, they, they, I've, I've always uh, been interested in it. It's funny in the ambulance chaser, uh, Jason is uh, antithetical to that. He's very, ambivalent of his family's Holocaust history and is kind of ashamed. So again, there's a little bit of me in that. And so uh, it, it just became a quest. It really literally became a quest to figure out who these people were. Uh, because really, the only one who would know is my mother, and her, fa her father never talked about it. Is your mother alive? No. Yeah, she, yes, is, she is alive. Yeah. Oh, good. And, yeah, so he never talked about it. And it was very emotional reconnecting with everyone. Uh, your your dad never talked about it. You're saying, or well, my dad was uh, my dad had diff different family line. They all made it out uh -huh. from uh, the Kiev area. This is her mother's father. The mother's yeah, father. This is my mother's family line. Yes. Gotcha. So did so did, did, since her so her father never spoke about it. Is what her you're saying? Her father never spoke about it. Her father had a. A uh, two brothers and a sister. One brother went to at that time Palestine, mm -hmm. right? And another brother went to New York. And then my grandfather Fred went to New York as well. So uh, it was just kind of spread out. And what was your mother's reaction to you discovering all this information? Very grateful, very grateful, uh, because she had uh, there was just no one left to uh, talk about it. And they're all you know I was getting up in age, and you forget things, and. Uh, it, I really had thought I'd hit a dead end till I found it was the relative of one of the other brothers. Interesting. So this, but the, but the book is, I see a parallel with the book in the sense that 
here also it was almost like novel like the fact that you went in you know and did the detective work this was a detective story also yeah. the way you uncovered what was happening and and the, the same and you created the novel also based on your legal knowledge also yes yes uh, the the ambulance chaser is isn't really a technical courtroom uh, it's more of a uh, a chase movie right a, a chase book mm -hmm. where someone's being chased but it's uh there are legal aspects to it obviously uh but uh yeah there is just uh there's a heavy Jewish influence in the book, obviously. Uh, I mean, his name is so Feldman. It, it was, the guy's yeah, name is... Which is my mother's maiden name. Oh, that's interesting. That, that makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, first off, for our global audience, where, where does one... I assume you can get the book on Amazon. Is it out yet? It's for, out for pre-order uh, on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. If you're anti-Amazon, uh -huh. you can get it on Bar Barnes and Noble. I th it's been interesting. People are anti-Amazon and that's fine. So uh, make sure, you know, you get, get it there as well. But, uh, Pe yeah, it comes out, Dece it's a release December 7th. Pre-orders are going great. That That's and, awesome. Uh, Pe people say to you, Hey, I'm not going to buy this on Amazon because they're ruining the world. Basically. I've had that a few times. Yeah. People just don't want it. And that's fine. Yeah. People just don't want to buy, uh, buy things on Amazon yeah. for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. I have but, uh, no morals when it comes to Amazon because <laughs> it's so convenient, you know, they already have oh. your child. But uh, you know what happened? I have a new shelf. We live in a condominium. I have a new shelf just for the books that all these wonderful creative people that we interview uh, write. Yes. And I always, and they say, oh, I'll autograph it for you. I said, you don't have to autograph it. I have proof. I have you on video, you know? That's so, right. That's right. So. We have a, a guest coming up uh, in the beginning of August who wrote a book titled People Love Dead Jews. Yeah. Is that correct, Carmela? People Love Dead and which, Jews. Yeah. Which I actually thought was about comedy, but it is far from comedy. No, it's not comedy. It's a, it's a novelist who, who wrote a... I'm doing homework on that, but that I got involved emotionally in that book. Tell us why you're involved in that real quick. I think I will skip that right now. It has to, it has to do with the Holocaust. She doesn't like to talk about it. No, Fine. no, no. Uh, may, may, I, um, may I say something? I am more interested in Brian's. I, I picture you as a child. I picture you as an adolescent. And, and uh, I listened to one of the... I think it was a podcast that you were like for an hour podcast where mm -hmm. you were talking about these things. And well, and speaking of that, Brian, take us back to your childhood. What were you like as a kid? You grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, what were you into sports? I was very quiet and shy. Uh, my childhood was not, as I look back, a good one. If you've looked at uh, in terms of uh, I was severely bullied as a child. I was a heavy kid. Mm -hmm. And uh it was, uh, it was, it was, if you've read any of my stuff, I was, uh, bullied over my weight. I was even physically assaulted mm -hmm. over, over my weight. And it led to a lot of, uh, traumatic, a lot of trauma and a lot of, uh, uh, body image issues. I became addicted to alcohol and cocaine mm -hmm. in 2005. I decided to end my life by suicide. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was literally saved at the last moment. My older brother, Mark, and my younger brother, Jeff, at the urging of a friend came into my house I had a 45 automatic on my nightstand wow. and uh, there was drugs everywhere and uh, it didn't end there. Uh, I, I delved back deep into addiction and depression, lost my career as a lawyer. And finally in 2007, after my second trip to a psychiatric hospital, I began my recovery. Good, good for you, man, that you stuck it out and are where you're at today. But I mean, I don't want to harp too much on the negative, but I think people need to hear these stories and, uh, Especially, and, especially when people went through terrible times yeah. and then they come out of it and, and, and yeah, they, they, see, they see the, the positivity in yes. the light, but so yeah. to, and so, the positivity is it all made me who I am today. Yeah, absolutely. So, but, but going back to 2005, what, what made you hit that extreme low where you had a 45 on your, uh, uh, I, I got to a point in my life where I saw no hope. I, I lost all hope uh, of ever living a life that I wanted, uh, free of alcohol, free of drugs. 
and achieving, living my best life and achieving. Uh, we can, we, we're, it's fine to talk about it. My brother, Mark owns the Mavericks mm-hmm. and the, uh, and the shark tank guy he's done. You know, <laughs> I, I have very successful brothers and what, what's ha- what happened to me certainly isn't their fault, but I had no identity of my own. And when you don't have an identity, it's hard to have purpose in life. And I came to the point where I decided that I would do it, be doing my family a favor by ending my life. And that's how it got there. Well, listen, I think that's a very common sort of thought and probably something that's a common thread in many families. Yours happens to be an extreme case because everyone knows your brother. But I was always the brother of Arden Waldman, who was a valedictorian of my high school who literally has never done a bad thing in her life. Not and so, yet, not yet. She still has a I, chance. I, I never, you know, never, One opportunity. I, I never had those thoughts, but on a micro level, I, uh, you know, I always remember when I went into high school, I was always Arden's brother and not, jo- uh, not the, Joel our daughter, Our daughter is five years older than he is. Yes. And she's a very, very, very unusual person in the sense of... She has literally, I don't think she's ever cursed... She used to study from- I don't think she ever drank coffee. I don't think she's ever had coffee. I don't think she's ever had alcohol. <laughs> no alcohol. Sometimes she is. Maybe little, she's right? secretly a cocaine addict and we don't know. <laughs> uh, we don't know, but I mean- You hope, but she isn't. But, that, but, there's, but there's, I wasn't secretly. I was, I was out there. <laughs> so- I so, forget so, now. I forget now. There was an incident. It's my senior moment and I'm curious. Uh, there was an incident where you got a thousand dollars for something. Oh yeah, that's a great story. Let's Tell hear it. Let's hear it. I, I don't. I truly don't remember the details, but I know it's yeah. a great story. It wasn't great at the time, but uh, you look back on it <laughs> yeah. and laugh. Now I can't. It was uh, 2007, the summer of 2007, when the Mavericks were going to the NBA championship for the very first time. So, as you might ex- imagine, it was a great time for everyone, and I was going to get some good seats, tickets for those games. <laughs> and I also had the opportunity to get a couple tickets for friends. I called up Mark, and he said, sure, come on over and get them. Mm-hmm. And I didn't give them to my friends. I traded them to my cocaine dealer for $1,000 in cocaine. <laughs> so, my dealer shows up at my house. It gets better. Mm-hmm. My dealer shows up at my house. I hand him the tickets. He gives me this giant Ziploc baggie of cocaine. <laughs> I go running upstairs to my home office. I dump it out all on my desk like I'm Scarface. Why don't you go, right? <laughs> Put rub your nose in it. And uh, of course, I had to line some out. And cocaine users are a funny bunch. Well, pandemic times, you put on the hand sanitizer, you wash your hands. But we'll stick a dollar bill up our nose that's been used by God knows who <laughs> and God knows where and snort, right? Fit, go figure. <laughs> But cocaine has long stopped giving me the feeling of self-love and self-acceptance. And I was just chasing up highs and there was a lot of shame. And there was also a lot of paranoia. Do I hear the cops outside? Woo-hoo. I go peeking out the cardboard of my window. There are no cops, but I'm all paranoid. So I take the cocaine, I put it Listen back in the Ziploc the, bag. I remember now. Okay, go ahead. I hide it. I drive to a Home Depot where I buy electrical faceplate outlets, a drill and a saw. I drive back to my house. I go to the drywall in the closets upstairs with the drill. Bzz, 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 and I create these fake electrical outlets. I put Wait. the cocaine in smaller Ziploc baggies, slap the face plates on. Bzz, 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 by, the way, it's, by the way, it's a brilliant idea. I don't <laughs> know if we are giving ideas to other people. Did you read <laughs> about this? How did you have the idea? I'm not handy. I could never do that. I saw it in the sky. You, but you know, like the cops and the DEA and the drug dogs have never thought of that one before. Yeah. <laughs> but I actually, that's a great question. I saw it in a Sky Mall magazine. Remember <laughs> Sky Mall? Yeah. Remember Sky yeah, Mall? Yeah, Sky American, whatever, the yeah. magazine? Yeah. They had these little safes that were electrical outlets. <laughs> and that, that's, how I, that's how I got there. So this was just like a, a fit of paranoia you were having at the moment? Yeah. And you went out? Yeah. And then I, I got paranoid again and I flushed it all down the toilet. Mm. Now it's $900 worth of cocaine. I wake up the next morning and realizing I'm a moron because I flushed all my cocaine down the toilet and there was another game that night. So I got two more tickets, called my drug dealer again. He shows up at my house and said, dude, you did all that last night. I don't want to say I'm an idiot and flushed it down the toilet. I said, yes, give me more. Okay, here you go. Running back up to my home office, rinse, wash, repeat, dump it out do some. And it was never an epiphany that I might have a problem. It was maybe I need to change dealers. 
maybe I need to switch out the gray goose for the Jack Daniels. Yeah. And I, I hide it again. I get paranoid again. I go back to that same toilet, drop to my knees like I'd done so many times, uh, hoping or wishing for someone to take away this savage urge and pain and shame and flushed it again. Twice. Second night. Twice. They say when Dallas flushes, it runs downhill to Houston. So I think some people <laughs> in Houston had a little hop in their step those two nights. So did yeah. anyone wonder why the drug dealer showed up in your seats instead of whoever was supposed to show up there? Uh, uh, no, those weren't my, those were other seats. Oh, those other, were other seats. Did you end yeah, up? I going? couldn't get away with that. But you know, what's interesting is, is that, uh, I was, show, I used to sit right next to Mark on the floor mm-hmm. and I was showing up coked up, drunk, slobbering. And he finally said, you, you, you're an embarrassment. You just can't. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so that was, and, uh, and, and, and it, and it wasn't about me. I mean, and I made it about me, of course, being, you know, suffering from addiction. It wasn't about a problem. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's very cl- a classical thing to do, but yeah. so, you know, I, mean, I don't want to compete with you. I really don't, but I am also paranoid all the time without, uh, without the <laughs> cocaine. <laughs> yeah. Right or wrong? Oh, yeah. when I was deep in, when I was deep in my addiction, I would, when I would go to these different dealers houses and they would have their, their entire house would be cardboarded. So paranoid. I mean, they, they would have cardboard over all windows and you couldn't even see <laughs> Turn a lamp on. That's wild. Yeah. The, I guess cocaine and the Holocaust will do it to you. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, so back to, so back, to, I'm curious about this because I think a lot of people need to hear this because, you know, again, mental illness is something that's still a, a stigma, but sure. 2005, you're sitting there and Mark and your brother, Jeff, they, they get word that something might be going on and they show up. And how does that play yeah. out? I mean, that might, that had to be. Jeff a, showed up. Mark was in LA. Uh-huh. Uh, Jeff showed up first and he took the gun. Uh-huh. Uh, he uh, gathered, he cleaned up all the cocaine and I also had black marks. I had a bunch of Xanax flying around Mm -hmm. because cocaine addiction, very common. You uh, do cocaine all night and you Xanax your way through the day Mm -hmm. and just, and it's very hard to be a practicing lawyer while you're doing that. (laughs) And, uh, or you're really good, I guess. They are a uh, very talented family. Yeah. I I mean, I've done cocaine in federal courthouses, state courthouses. (laughs) I've showed up to hearings under the influence And, 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 and none of this is really uncommon. Uh, it's actually quite a big problem in the legal profession. But uh, so they cleaned it up and they took me kicking and screaming uh, down to the local psychiatric hospital. They're trying to save my life. And all I want was for them to get out of my life and let me go back and hang out with the people who love me, truly love me, at least until the cocaine is runs out, right? Mm-hmm. Then they don't love you anymore. Uh, the people I partied with. But uh, they were there, loved me dearly and were very close. And so they took me down there. And they wanted to put a hold on me, a psychiatric hold, but I knew what to say because I'm a lawyer. I wasn't going to let that happen. So uh, I'm not a danger to myself, not a danger to others. So they couldn't do that. So mm-hmm. we did what I call the Cuban rehab. Mm-hmm. They, uh, they took my car keys and said, stay in your house for two weeks and everything's going to be okay. That's not how addiction works. No. But my family's no different than anyone else. They're struggling to learn at that time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the other thought I had was no problem. My drug dealer delivers, right? Take my car keys. <laughs> I don't care. And so uh, to, show, to show them how much they weren't going to control my life, the moment they left, I called a cab and got a, took a cab to the dealership and got a new set of keys made. <laughs> That's you got a new set of keys made the minute they left. Uh, now, I mean, Brian, is this, does this stem, do you think, this is the, so my dad is a retired psychiatrist and she's a retired social worker. Um, I mean, do, Looking at it and analyzing it and breaking it down, do you think things were exacerbated because of your brother's success without blaming your brother? But I mean, uh, that's a great question. And I get asked to hear that. Uh, as I said, I had no identity. When Mark became internationally famous, it wasn't a matter of jealousy, mm-hmm. it was a matter of me not knowing who I was, right? Mm-hmm. And I hated myself. I'm in my 40s now, and I had literally never loved myself uh, sober a moment in my life, never. I looked in the mirror and I saw this ugly monster, not will. And I've been mar- uh, divorced three times all because of drugs and alcohol. I saw this person unworthy of love on any level. So how was I going to be loved 
well, I can be Mark Cuban's brother and get all this fake love and fake adulation. And I can, people give me free drugs. I can date girls half my age, uh, just and with relationships based solely around drugs, right? When you're dating someone 20 years younger than you, that's the common ground. And, uh, and get, walk in any club and I could be Mark Cuban's brother. That's not Mark's fault. And get all these things that make me feel like I'm somebody, even though that is not anything that defined who I really was. It, down as that, who I really was, was a shy, hurt, little 13 year old boy who felt unloved. And until I healed that little boy, and I'd been dragging that little boy around on a suitcase over a gravel road on a tractor trier my entire life mm-hmm. and just filling up that suitcase with pain and trauma. And eventually it, it, it explodes open, right? It can't hold anymore. And uh, until I peeled back all the layers and just told that, told that little boy, which I still do today, that he was loved, that it wasn't his fault, and that he was enough and it was okay to love himself, uh, I wasn't going to heal. And that healing began finally in Easter of 2007, when I finally got in uh, honest with my psychiatrist, who had been lying to, lying to, lying to for two years, just getting antidepressants while I'm also using cocaine and drinking. That works out well. Oh, boy. And, uh, and finally getting honest with him and finally tearing back all the layers of my life and allowing myself to be vulnerable and finally allowing myself to cry for that little boy. What was the tipping point for you? What made you decide to be honest, you know, going from lying, lying, lying to suddenly being honest with your shrink? Uh, it was standing in the site parking lot of a psychiatric hospital for the second time, realizing there wouldn't be a third time. And I don't know why then in 2005, not 2005, right? Mm-hmm. Who knows? Uh, realizing that there wasn't going to be a third trip. And also thinking about my father, uh, my father, who was of the greatest generation, fought in fought in the Pacific on Okinawa, fought in Korea. He was the middle of three boys like me. And he and his older brother, Marty, they owned a trim shop in Pittsburgh. They put on convertible seats and, uh, and things like that. For over, uh, since from the end of the Korean War until his brother passed in 99 from cancer. And I thought of something he said to me and Mark and Jeff and I all the time. He said, guys, whatever you do in life, wherever you go, pick up the phone and tell your brother you love him. Make sure you know your brother's okay. This was the relationship my father had with his two brothers, and he was given, passing this gift on to us. And standing there in that parking lot, I realized I was, getting, I was close to losing my family, not losing their love, but families get frustrated, and it was happening. People were distancing. I wasn't seeing my nieces. I wasn't seeing my nephews. And if you want to know how that gift stuck, all these decades later, 1,200 miles from Pittsburgh, Mark, Jeff, and I live walking distance to each other. And until my father passed three years ago, he lived across the street from me. Hmm. And I wasn't ready to lose that. And, and I decided it was time. But all along, all along, and I know you are modest about it, what happened to you is that you, you, were a, you had intelligence. You know, A, you couldn't have led that life with the legal stuff and all that. And your brain also kind of suddenly switched to working for you instead of working against you. But your intelligence was always there. Yeah, Mark's the real failure. He didn't become a lawyer. <laughs> you know what's funny? There's a funny story here. Uh, you know, brother, we're all very different as brothers, right? So uh, my younger brother, Jeff, uh, we, we all just, Jeff uh, has his master's in counseling, but uh, we're all very different. Uh, and I, I remember yeah, about, uh, are we running out of time? No, 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 no. no, no. We, he, he's not. Brian, this happens every week. Carmela takes on a secondary role of being a production manager. And she's <laughs> telling me I'm out of frame when I'm not out of frame. Okay. Which drives me insane because she. <laughs> no, yeah. I get anxious that he's his half of his body is cut off. Yeah, I see that too, but I figured you know what you were no, doing. No, we so. know what we're doing, but okay, Brian, just so be I, thankful I your mother's about... not a Holocaust survivor. Go, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was about four or five years ago. I got this email from this guy. I don't know. He said your brother was on. Who's the guy who rings all the bells? A financial guy, Kramer or whatever. His Kramer, name is. yeah, yeah. Right. So I guess Jim my brother Kramer. was on it. 
Jim Cramer. My brother was on his show and Kramer asked if his brothers, and we never talk about each other publicly, mm-hmm. right? That, that, that much unless uh, we ask each other to. Right. And I guess Kramer asked him, uh, do you, are, you, do you, are your brothers motivated by the way you are? And he said, no. So I get this email from this person, your brother just slammed you on Kramer, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I, and I thought, wait a minute, he would never do that. And so I've, I found the show mm-hmm. and it was, is your brother motivated by money? Mm-hmm. By getting, you know, Mark always said, my goal is to be a millionaire. And I'm not. We are very different that way. I, that, I am not motivated in that way. He's a, we, we're all different people. And uh, so it was, he was being truthful. That so, isn't what motivates me. Mark failed again. He said, Mark said he wanted to be a millionaire. He didn't, did not succeed at that either. Because he became yeah, a billionaire. Yeah. And, yeah. and it may have been I wanted to be a billionaire. Maybe it started out millionaire. Now that it transitioned to billionaire. <laughs> my, my motivation is that every day I share my story, if one person takes something from it and begins the journey towards recovery, then I have accomplished a lot. That, that's why right? I think this and is what, so what, important. What, What's the, what's the saying, uh, uh, tikkun alem, changing the world with acts of kindness. Exactly. So we, we had a and guest. I try to change my little part of the world. We had, mm-hmm. um, you may know him, Brian, uh, James Donaldson on. He played for the Seattle Supersonics. He was a yeah. center. So we had him on a couple of, of weeks ago. He was actually running for mayor of Seattle, but he kind of had a charmed life. He was a first round draft pick everything going his way. He, he was a successful businessman after the NBA, but then he, uh, because of his height, he's 7'2", he had some cardiac issues and it was a domino effect. He had a heart attack a few years back. Then law, his wife left him, her child who was his child left him, um, lost his business and, uh, he became suicidal as well. And, uh, and no, no, he really, really, um, turned he's, things around. he's a, you know, he's seven foot two. I watched the, when, when he came, before he came on, I watched when he played. He's an unbelievable athlete, unbelievable. I, I, I admired him. And, and, but he has, he has had such a generous heart. And this is exactly what he's trying to do, what you are trying to do in his own community, because sure. he explained to us that in the African American community, it's such a stigma. Uh, that the uh, they the men don't talk about if they're depressed, because in a certain way you were depressed also. Just uh, you. Oh, can't. I'm still. I uh, I suffer from uh, major depress- depressive episodes still today, even in recovery. And, and what when when you experience that now without the you know without the cover of cocaine or other drugs, wh- how how do you deal with it? Uh, I I take antidepressants for one, that, which uh, keeps it from getting. Too low, right? Uh-huh. I, I, I'm on Lexapro, and uh, I I talk to my psychiatrist once a week, and I have family and my wife, and so I am. Uh, I may I may experience those bouts, but now I know I have people I can talk to and help I can get, and I take it. Interesting. And you hang before out it, before it really bottoms out. Now, now your your brother Jeff is younger, right? He's he's the youngest. Yes, we're all uh, three to three and a half years apart. Oh, so not that young, and. Uh, so how's your relationship with the two of them now? Is it, is it wonderful? Wonderful. We see each other as much as we can. And again, they, uh, they live walking distance. So it's, it's a, it's a wonderful relationship. They, uh, we do anything for each other. That's, that's great. I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious to hear more about your, uh, your dad. Did you, what, what other, uh, so he had a, uh, uh, like a, like a body type shop. Did you say? Yeah, it's a trim upholstery. shop. Upholstery. Upholstery. Yeah, upholstery. That's right. He put on upholstery seats. Ta-da, I knew yeah. it. Put on convertible tops. Uh-huh. And it was in the same show. It was called Regency Products in Pittsburgh in Dormont in the same spot uh, for over 40 years. So, uh, just a, a working guy. He was, so, I mean, he was basically a blue collar worker. Yes. And yes. Uh, one of these guys that would go in, come home at five, maybe crack open a beer, have dinner and hang out with his kids. Exactly. I mean, that's it. Uh, we, uh, our vacations when we uh, we take every now and then he take us uh, to, to New York State to the Poconos to the the Jewish Riviera to the, <laughs> uh, the so a place called the Nevely. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so we and we would take those, but th- those were our. That's what we did. So and, what, uh, he what, was a hardworking family guy, and 
I miss him dearly. Yeah, he said to you, always tell your brothers you love him. Any other kind of uh, fatherly advice that he gave you? I'm curious. Well, well, can I just say something in here, interject? Just the mere fact that he was so close to his own, his father was so close to his own brothers. Mm. And for 40 years, I mean, you said somewhere that they sometimes they would bicker a little. It's like a bad marriage. Yeah, I mean, you work together. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> You know, brothers with siblings fight, right? I mean, it, it is what it is, but uh, but yeah, but they, it, but still, he modeled it to them. He modeled yeah. to his sons how to get along with your two brothers. Yeah. And like, he didn't want us to. He didn't want us to follow in his footsteps. He made sure we all go to college. Went to college, uh, which he he went to a business school. He didn't go to the college, and uh, he made sure. I mean, he wanted us to exceed his dreams. And he had the chance to see that you all were okay before he passed away. Yeah, yes, and uh, he, in a way, uh, saved my life. I remember was it instrumental, and in, uh, not only his love, but I remember not long after I got sober, or maybe it was a week. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, she stood by me. Mm. We had uh, been living together for about a week, and she moved out. And. Uh, I went over to my father's house and he uh, apartment across the street, and he knew nothing about my problem. Mm -hmm. And I sat down and I started crying and crying and bawled and told him all of my everything. And uh, his response was, uh, "I'll break up here." <laughs> his response was, uh, "Brian, I love you. Move in with me. We'll get through this together." A real mensch. That's, fa no, that's fatherly father love. That's that's fatherly love. Father. He has three kids, so now he knows. He started late. I'm a masochist, Brian. I'm 52, <laughs> and I have a uh, a seven, a five, and a two year old. This is his oh, first. Okay. This is yeah. his first ma ma marriage. First go around. I waited. I worked in the crazy news business, so I never settled down till later. Um, yeah. I, I actually had my. I love to share this on this podcast. I had a my phys my annual physical today. And I complained of utter exha exhaustion, and the doctor said, "It's because you have three kids." So <laughs> I, I felt I felt better after hearing that. But um, one one issue that I think is really interesting, which we touched upon, and I don't want to make this the morbid uh, podcast hour. But it's and it's been a lot of fun so far. Bulimia. That's something you don't really hear amongst men. Men, but sure. I, I assume this goes back to your weight issue as a child. And body then, image issues, yes. And it carried over. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, and, and, and just uh, statistically for your audience, uh, about 30% of all those with eating disorders, if not more, uh, are male, even though only one in 10 will seek treatment. But uh, because it's so shameful, even today. I, uh, my bulimia dates back to my freshman year at Penn State, mm -hmm. where, uh, and this was before uh, bulimia had only been a clinical diagnosis, and this was 1979. And it had only been a clinical diagnosis for a few years, and I didn't know what an eating disorder was. And it was uh, four years before singer Karen Carpenter passed away, uh, bringing it. eating disorders into the pre-digital national spotlight, but kind of cementing the stereotype as woman, right? Mm -hmm. uh, female disorder. So uh, binging and purging uh, kind of became my way of feeling good for a few moments. Uh, I would, uh, I was at college, I would do it, and when I did it, and I don't want to get too uh, Graphic in case you have people. I don't want to trigger anyone if you have people nah, we're, who are struggling with an eating we disorder. Talk, we talk about everything here. Whatever, whatever you're comfortable <laughs> no, with. Whatever. I'm just not going to get detailed about what I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, and every time I did it, I had this feeling of kind of peace came over me in my stomach that I was finally worthy and that girls would like me and that my mother would love me. And she did love me dearly. She was just struggling with her own mental health issues. Uh, but then the feeling went away and the shame swept in, the shame of engaging in an act that I didn't understand, but felt inherently shameful. Guys don't stick their finger down their throat, even if I didn't know what that was. But I had to have that feeling of peace again and again. And that also, uh, I transitioned, uh, I developed, not transition because I was doing them both at the same time. I developed exercise bulimia as well, which is obsessive compulsive exercise for the primary purpose of offsetting calories. Mm -hmm. So I was running 10 miles a day, 20 miles a day while I was binging and purging and then added alcohol to that resume my sophomore year at Penn State. So I was putting a lot of stress on my body and it was brutal. It was a brutal time. Wow. It, it's kind of wild. And I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but it's like 
an amazing discipline used in completely the wrong, you know, it, it's like in a weird way, you have to be disciplined to do all that, to run to and do all these things, but it's kind of a it's misguided, a mis, it's a compulsion. It's not, yeah. not, it's not, not, a, a, it's a not a discipline. It's, it's like it, you have to do it. Yeah, like I have yeah. to eat you cake. You hit it right on the nose. Yeah. And it's, because the underlying disorder was called body dysmorphic disorder. Yeah. Uh, BDD. Yeah. And that is on the obsessive compulsive spectrum. Yes. And I, I so, dated a girl so, with that. Yes, you, yes, hit it right you on dated the nose. a beautiful I girl with that. I dated a very good looking young woman who had BDD. And it, it all uh, manifested itself through her hair. Remember that? Yes, I remember. She couldn't leave the house for like three, four hours till sure. her hair was perfect. Yeah, that's, all, that, that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, every time I looked in the mirror, uh, I saw this huge stomach. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, were, there were times when I, I had to try on every pair of pants in my, in my house uh, before I would leave the house. Uh, if any pair of pants felt tight, I wouldn't leave the house. And uh, I would, all these, I would spend an hour in the shower self-inspecting my body, like my eyes could laser whether I've gained an inch of fat. It's a very, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough disorder that affects men and women equally, about one in two percent of the population, but has a very high correlation to eating disorders, uh, drug addiction, and suicide. Do you still have residual effects of the uh, body dysmorphic disorder? Are you over that? Yes, or? yes. My my greatest struggle today would be my relationship with exercise and food. But I've been through uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, accept, acceptance and commitment therapy. So now I have tools. Now in my, my 60s, I have tools that when these thoughts come in, I'm able to say, okay, I'm not my thoughts. Where is this thought coming from? How am I going to channel this thought? So I don't, uh, I don't segue down the road of uh, the highway of dysfunctional and destructive behavior. Which is a great lesson for everyone listening that you can gather those tools as you go through life and put them in your toolbox and use them when you need it. Um, I understand you're also the executive director of the Mark Cuban Foundation. Is that right? Well, the, yeah, I was, but now that, that, that was the Fallen Patriot Fund. Okay. And what the Fallen Patriot Fund did, what, did was uh, provide uh, financial assistance to uh, seriously wounded uh, veterans of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He started right after the conflict started, Mark started the fund. And the fund has changed now to first responders, but during the time when I was uh, overseeing it, and now I'm not, uh, it, gave, it gave away over $5 million to uh, veterans of OIF. Interesting. And uh, Facebook, you've got a, a history with Facebook and trying to eliminate uh, hate speech hate on speech, there? Yes. Yeah, tell, That's that, interesting because I know it's on my Wikipedia page. It says yeah. I'm some kind of First Amendment expert, and I'm not. <laughs> I didn't put that up there. I don't know how to take it down. <laughs> I don't practice First Amendment law. Right. Uh, but what did happen was in 2008, I, uh, I reached out to Facebook because they were allowed, there was a lot of Holocaust denial content. And it's not a first First Amendment issue because Facebook's a private company. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Facebook, Facebook's rule says, we do not allow hate speech. So I argued with them, well, this is hate speech. Why are you allowing this? It's anti-Semitic hate speech. And it got picked up by CNN. It got picked up by a bunch of different people. And all of a sudden, boom, I'm in this, uh, I'm in this uh, nationally uh, broadcasted dispute with Facebook. And it was, I went out to Facebook and spoke when they were out in uh, uh, their, their old headquarters. I got to speak at uh, uh, the, uh, the Holocaust uh, Museum in Los Angeles. That one, I forget the full name, the uh, Simon Weisenthal Museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was, it was an interesting time, but they didn't do anything about it. And then finally, just last year, they decided they would no longer allow Holocaust in our content. So it took what? It was over a decade before they did anything. Interesting. But no, I, I, I am not a First Amendment lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> What's your, uh, what would be your message to kids today who, who might be getting bullied in school and to their parents who, you know, so they don't get in the same mindset that, you know, you put yourself in after this happened? I'd say, find who are, who are the people that you can trust? Who are the people that you can talk to? Even if it's a classmate, a teacher, a, uh, find somebody, find somebody to talk to because talking is so important. Talking helps. Reach out to somebody uh, and, 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 and let people know your pain. Let people, uh, let, let people understand what you're going through. And I know that's hard as a child. 
And that's why I tend to be focused more on parents. What do the parents do, right? Absolutely. Because it's much, it's much because children aren't, no matter, children don't have those real abilities, right? Uh, depending on your age. Uh, you just know you want to be accepted. Right. Uh, you just know that you're, uh, you feel lonely, you feel alone. And it's a much different age than when I was going through it. There was no, in my, in my day, going viral meant 15 kids in the lunchroom knew you had been bullied. Yeah, now the, uh, now the landscape is, how do you think social media has changed and complicated the landscape? Oh, it's, it's made it awful in terms, it's, it's made it awful. And I don't know what the solution is because anonymity and uh, it becomes much easier to form bully mobs, right? Because pin, uh, kids spend so much time online. There was no such thing in my day. You know, and uh, I, w- I wish I had an answer other than parents doing what they can to uh, encourage their children to tell them what they're going through. Ryan, this is getting now a new variation on the theme. Now they are even bullying kids if they wear a mask or if they don't wear a mask. <laughs> Now it's yeah. not only, you know, not only their physical appearance or they're wearing glasses or they have red hair or they're Jewish or they're, you know, sure. whatever. Now it's even the mask is becoming a bully. Well, I think I so think, what do you, yeah. and I don't know what you do because people, schools have zero tolerance policies, fine. And you do all these things, but kids are still going to be kids. And uh, they were, kids were kids then, kids were kids, you know, back in my dad's age and they're kids now. So how do we how do we address that? I don't. I wish I had the answer. Yeah, I wish I had the answer well, to that I, too. I I have an answer. Carm, what's your answer? Carm, <laughs> Carm has an answer to everything. Carm, what's your answer? That's my trademark. Yeah. I know. I have an. I think that the as you said, the absolute most important thing is for the parents to have an open line of communication with their kids. If the kid comes home from who. Or school and looks completely d- deflated and and discouraged that and the parent can ask what's the matter and the kid is has a relationship good enough to be able to say uh, sure. they did this to me or I feel they did that to me or so so the open yeah. lines of community like in a marriage yeah it's it's interesting in the ambulance chaser uh, my novel uh, the protagonist Jason's mom as a child. Uh, gave him a locket that on the front is the tree of life. On the back, it said, Tikkun Olam, always be kind. Tikkun oh, Olam, always be kind. Brian, what was your reaction to the... Uh, I am going to get your book, by the way. What uh, was definitely. Your, what, it goes on, the, uh, with, and I read them too. What, what was your... Uh, when you heard about the shooting at the Tree of Life synagogue, what was your uh, immediate reaction to that? I, I cried. Do you, it's, uh, you know it? It's hard for me to talk. I mean, uh, I have, I mean, I, I'm always I'm just a uh, few friends and people away from people who lost their lives. And uh, my grandparents uh, on both sides are, from, I mean, the Jew, it's, it's all the Jews went to Scroll Hill, right? Mm-hmm. In Pittsburgh, uh, they migrated from the Hill District to Scroll Hill. And uh, it was very difficult and it's still very emotional. What do you think of the state of the world today? I know that's a nice, narrow question. It's a very, no, no. yeah, it's a like. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I tell Carmel, I, I really feel like we're in some ways headed toward a uh, civil war in this country. I mean, we just feel so know, divided. But, but you, I, I mean, I'm, I mean, and, and uh, we, we all, we all from different generations. And I mean, and I remember growing up, I mean, you go through different generations and every generation, somebody's saying we're, you know, th- this is the worst it's ever been, right? So right. whether it's, you know, whether it's the Bay of Pigs or Kennedy's assassination or all these different things, Vietnam, uh, you, everyone. So I, I don't know. I, I believe in, I, I still believe in the goodness of human beings. And uh, the social media has made it difficult and uh, divide and polarized politics have made it difficult. And there was, there have always been polarized politics, always. Mm-hmm. But now it's, uh, Polarized on Twitter and Facebook and all these different things. And uh, it's, uh, I, I think we'll be okay. I, I really do. I think we'll be okay. That is wonderful. Your optimism broke through all of it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it too. Brian, you can help me with this. So I, I regress and turn into an infant next to my mother. But one thing I tell everybody is if I had 150, I don't know, I, I have OCD too, and I'm an odd. I like odd numbers. So I tell everyone, 
If I had $151 million in the bank, I wouldn't worry. Do you think your brother has ever worried since becoming a billionaire? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> wow, I feel so much better. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, he's, he's, he's my son, the idiot, you know? What is wrong with you him, just, too? You just changed my life, Brian. Thank you. I feel much better. He, he had, I mean, he, he has children, right? He has a wife. He, he's human like everyone else. Money, what, what, what did he say? Uh, I mean, money, if you're happy, money will make you happier. If you're not happy, money will not make you happy. And if you're worried, money will not unworry you. Now, you, I mean, you, you, it would be disingenuous. Obviously, there's all kinds of privilege, right? Uh, whether it's skin color or financial or whatever, people have different worries. Uh, but yes, I'm positive he worries. <laughs> <laughs> you, you really helped him. Yeah, thanks. It's good to know that. I will take pleasure in your brother's pain for a few moments. Um, Brian, it was an absolute pleasure. Let the audience know once again the name of the book. Sure. The name of the book is called The Ambulance Chaser. It's uh, available on Barnes & Noble and Amazon and it, for pre-order. Pre-orders help me a lot, please. Uh, we trying to get on the best- we will we will order. pre-order it. Now, if I order it. I'm trying to get on that bestseller list. And then, uh, it is, uh, yeah, and so you can, order, you can order it there, and it's released December 7th. Can we send it to you so you can sign it for us? No, no, we don't need to send it because <laughs> neither of us will send it. I'll do it. I'll no, do it. He, I wanna... will, he never does things like that. But we, we have you on tape, so I told you we don't need to. <laughs> uh, 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 many people are very creative, the people we, we uh, interview here. And uh, I told Joel on the way Brian, he... by the way, once again... I will point out, this is Carmela's absolute specialty. Whenever I'm trying to wrap up an interview, she just goes on another tangent. Keep going, Carm. No, Keep going. Now I forgot. Now I forgot. Now I forgot. I, now I have a senior <laughs> moment, and it's all your fault. He loves to create senior moments for me to point out I, that I'm 82. Darn it. <laughs> I have them too. No, no. I said to him on the way here, I remembered, in the car, because he drove here. We are in Miami. So I said to him that I feel now, I feel that we should put in a, a slogan with our, with our. Um, Spit it out, Carm. Uh, no, with our podcast, the slogan should be, we don't do celebrity interviews. We do fascinating, interesting people interviews. There you go. There yeah. you go. Nice, so, that's a nice short tagline. So even if your brother ever wanted to be interviewed, we are not doing it. <laughs> uh, I, I think he's kind of interesting, but I'm, I'm biased. Yeah. Okay, okay. So if he's also in, maybe on those grounds. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I'm biased to love my brother. Brian, yes, come yes. out come out and visit us sometime in Miami. Yeah. I will. I, I actually get down there quite. I haven't since the pandemic, but uh, uh, pre-pandemic, we got. To, I got down there quite a bit. I'd love to meet you both in person. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, okay. we'll do it. Thank you so much Thank for you, joining Brian, us. And thanks for finding my prodigious son <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> it was. It was such an honor to be on with both of you. I really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, we'll thanks be... a lot. And good luck in everything you're doing. We'll be right Thank back you. with a new schmooze. Welcome back. It's time for the news schmooze. Con. It's the news schmooze, and the first story is right up my alley. And let me tell you something. When I got that text to wear collared shirts, my stress level went from 1 to 181 for multi a multitude of reasons. You don't but mainly understand. because you said something to me the night. Literally the night before, <laughs> it's almost like the two okay, of you are I'll conspiring. It to you. You, I called her. Yeah, you probably did. I, <laughs> I wouldn't, swear on my life, I don't even know. I wouldn't who put she it is. past you. I wouldn't no, put it because, past you. You know what, Joel? I because don't like you, being told you, what to I do. I always tell you, trust me, I'm not your enemy. You think anyone tells Mark Cuban to wear a collar or not to wear a collar? Yes. No, no one his does. His wife. No one does. Maybe his wife tells everyone else to go f themselves. Nah, don't, don't. Uh, by the way. By the way, when are we getting to the segment when I can say how I felt about the right interview? Now. Right now, this is the segment. This is we just interviewed him. <laughs> I can't stand. Are you I... ever going to figure this out? <laughs> well, what do you think of Brian? He's a, a real mensch, an no, interesting guy. No, I I tell you something. Very warm, very warm. 
he is very, you know what? You have to give him more credit than his two brothers. Screw his brothers. No, because he struggled through life. He had terribly hard times. And now at the age of 60, he has arrived and he knows who he is. He knows what he wants. He's very bright and a very feeling person, a very, very deeply emotional. emotionally. Yeah. And, uh, you can just tell he's a good soul. He's a good guy. Exactly, exactly. And whatever he did, and if people become judgmental and they judge the fact that he was a drug addict. Listen, I'm the loser in my family that became a quote unquote journalist. Everyone else is a doctor. My sister, as we talked about in the last segment, is like the perfect child. I bought myself a shirt. Three, three, four weeks ago that says black sheep on it, because that's how I felt my whole life. I'm so proud of you. So I can only imagine what it's like for Brian. The thing is that Arden is actually more perfect than Mark, I bet. I think think there is a lot of truth in it. I'm Um, sorry. I, I think when Arden was born, I said, Arden is a beautiful baby. I didn't know that she was cloned after Roy and I just carried her. I thought I it was kind of funny. I never thought about you that you were cloned after. Look, Mark did not become a doctor or a lawyer. Brian did. And Mark said he was going to be a millionaire and he didn't do it. He became a billionaire. Accidents so he's failed. Ha- he's failed. Accidents um, happened. You plan for one thing and the next thing happens. Carm, on to the uh, new schmooze that we've now rambled on about and not discussed it. Story number one, close to my heart. Anxiety disorders, which typically develop early in a person's life, affect around one in 10 people and are twice as common in women compared to men, me being the exception. However, according to new research, regular exercise can reduce the risk of developing anxiety by almost 60% exercise. Now, the problem with this is I have a flap tear of my left meniscus. So, as you know, I was at the doctor today for my checkup, and I'm going to get that uh, arthroscopic surgery. Okay, go for it, Joel. Do you believe that anxiety, that uh, exercise reduces anxiety? Yeah, but you still have 40%. (laughs) (laughs) Because it said it reduces. This is why I'm doomed. <laughs> it said 60%. What did you tell me here on the way here to try? I told you I was having a lot of anxiety and on the way over here. You told me that even at 82, life's tumultuous. I'm like, tumultuous is a negative connotation. No, You're like, oh, I, no, we no. checked it on, the, on said, Google. And I, tumultuous is exciting. And then you said. Exciting with a lot of different things. Tumult, and then you, look and then, it and up. And then you said life is relentless. Wow, that's so uplifting. Now I feel less anxious that life is well, relentless. Uh, it was my husband when he retired. Uh, afterwards, he said one day, he says, since I retired, I didn't have one day off. Yeah. So this really allays all of my anxiety. And then on well, top Joel, of it, Joel, you on eat top of it, you after... called me, you called me a bitch. Never. You said, yes, you, don't lie. <laughs> Carm, you, you called me a bitch and an effing bitch. Where? On the drive over here, Carmela. I'm going to start to record it because you lie to everyone. When I'm trying, don't I look innocent? <laughs> when I'm, I'm an 82 year old little lady. I'm telling you, I'm going I'm to get pericarditis again. I'm telling you right now. Let's move is, on to the second. Are you definitely planning on it? This story I actually qu- kind of enjoy, which I shouldn't, um, but I secretly do. I probably they tortured cats or something. For years, Bob Enyart used his conservative media, plat- media platform in Denver to mock those who died of AIDS by name or oh, call for women who receive abortions to face a death penalty. And then Women who get abortions to face... Recently, the radio talk show host who had successfully sued the state over mass mandates and capacity limits in Colorado churches last year, he has joined now a chorus of conservative voices who have bashed the coronavirus and vowed to stay unvaccinated. There's only one problem with the story. He's now at least the fifth conservative radio talk show host to have died of COVID-19 in just the last six weeks. Why Why are we wasting time? Because it's hard for me to feel for this guy, telling women who had abortions to go get, to to put them to death. Can I just say something? Do you believe in karma? Do you believe in karma? 
Uh, I These don't guys know. Are... We have to define it more closely. No, the fact that this guy is talking shit. No, 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 no. I am not going there he because that... I have, I have well, a you're holier whole... than now. No, 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 no. But I'm holy... supposed to weep no, for this guy. Than not... Norm Macdonald not, dies, and I'm not, supposed to weep for this guy. Not holier than now. Holier than thou. I said holier than thou. <laughs> I said. <laughs> I'm tired already of this. By the suffering. way, did you did you did you like Norm Macdonald? Here, here's what here's what's like terrible about life. Norm MacDonald was a comedian who was on, people on, will say, on everyone Saturday knows who Norm Night Live. Is, Not everyone knows. Everyone else. There are people who live on the rocks. Uh, we, have, we have a global audience in England, and our Pakistani audience might not know. No, but, but Norm, Norman MacDonald was a really, really funny. No one called him Norman. It was Norm MacDonald. I don't even think his mother called. I don't even know his real name is Norman. I, they, these are the moments when I want my mommy. On to the last story. Honestly, I wish that I could hook up a heart monitor that you could feel my heart rate somehow. Okay, Joel, you had a... Okay. Roomba, Roomba 7 Plus, the latest version of iRobot's popular home vacuum, claims to give customers even more control over their clean with a camera that can identify and avoid pet droppings. Instead of smearing it all over the floor, the Roomba device will gracefully avoid the poop and even snap a picture and text it to your phone if you're out. It's $849, and it relies on AI, artificial intelligence, boosted brain and camera systems to identify objects on the floor in real time. I bring this up for two reasons. I tell you why you bring it up, because you bought it. You don't we have did a, not. We got the three hundred dollar model, not the two forty nine. I got to be honest, Ileana, my beloved wife, puts that on like at eight or nine when the kids go to sleep. Nine out of ten times, it scares the shit out of me because <laughs> I don't see it coming. But it's amazing. It cleans the house. It like washes the floor. It doesn't just vacuum. It also washes the floor. It's unreal. But here's the part of the story they're not telling you. As it's moving, not our model, but this model that we just talked about. It kills. It kills. It's taking pictures of the inside of your home, and they can sell that data. Paranoid now? Listen, let me tell you, I don't have to go further. I want equal time, 30 seconds of my paranoia. Yeah. By the way, Carmen, I have a big, big conference call today about the future of the podcast, about how to promote us, blow us up. Listen, I've been listening to Rogan, who's my competition in my head. <laughs> and look, I give him credit. He started in 2009. But if I hear the guy, he talks about the same five things. He's like Sean Hannity of, of podcasting. He's got like five talking points. Mm -hmm. He repeats the same shit over and over and over. Who said that one? Somebody, uh, the, I swear to you, I learned this in high school. I, we studied Latin in this horrible high school when we didn't have choke to, to write on the blackboard. You but studied says, Latin in, in a the, Serbian the, country? The mortibus nihil quod no bene. It means don't say anything bad about the dead. I just did about the talk show host. Who was I just saying bad things about? You just said something bad about somebody. Who? I forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> Who? Would, I just we were talking about vacuum cleaners. Oh, but after that. All right, we'll be right back with three questions for grandma. If anybody needs the Latin pronunciation, I'll repeat it. <laughs> It's time now for three questions for Grandma. Now, this is now time for three questions for Grandma. You're right. At the end of the last segment, we were talking about Rogan. I did not wish death on Rogan. I just said he says talks about the same five things over and over and over. I didn't say that you wished death on him. Nihil quod no bene. It means don't say anything about dead people. <laughs> He's not dead, though. <laughs> <laughs> I could be so confused. You're, you're speaking Serbian, but speaking Latin. Latin. So we, do you studied have a, a Latin. we studied <laughs> Latin in high school. It means don't say anything bad about dead people because they cannot defend I feel like them. only Americans should be studying Latin because yes, it would be weird would, with another accent. 
Well, with Hungarian and Serbian accent, it goes. But do you understand what I'm saying? If you shouldn't say anything bad about that people, you shouldn't say anything bad it's about life. It's called Haran. He exactly. Right. It's a big, big sin. Not supposed to talk bad. Well, then I would have died at age seven. Yeah. And not only that, it will be your downfall because one day when you're famous, they'll check all the people Good. you cursed Who cares? on the internet. Who cares? Okay, on to three questions for grandma. This one was brilliant by my beautiful, smart, intelligent, sassy daughter, Vita Alia. Daddy. Seven year old. Seven years old. So. How did you used to get things before Amazon? Do you care to answer, Carm? You went into your car. <laughs> you It's a really weird concept. Yeah. Drove to the... Uh, Think of shopping how, center. Yeah, she doesn't understand that. You went into the store. I mean, she gets store. it. She understands it. But you like, went into the store, and I said, "You said, can I please have whatever you wanted to buy?" And they, then you pay them with a charge card. Lately, before there were charge cards, you paid them with real money, and then you brought it home. I just read, by the way, that uh, Dunkin' Donuts just opened its first fully digital store. There's no person in there. You work, you order on an app, you go in, and a robot slides down your donuts and gives it to you. I am not suicidal, but this could make me suicidal. On There the... is nothing I like more than human contact, even the very minimal, superficial, stupid one. On to the next question. <sighs> I'm telling you, I'm having a hard time breathing from the anxiety. Why does it take Earth a whole year to spin around? Around the sun. Correct. Why? Yeah, I'll be honest. I'm afraid to ever answer these questions with my kids because I pay no attention to anything with like the solar system. There's well, a bunch well, of things well, I just don't well, care. You have to History, I don't care But wait about. a minute. It has to be turned around. What It takes an... A certain time for the for the Earth to turn around the sun. Let's say this is the sun. Correct. And they decided the human beings decided that that's gonna be a year. You understand? Yeah. The arbitrary part is what the human beings call that time. I have like a weird but, thing with like. But Joel, like, can you concentrate? No, I'm trying to tell you because it, it takes me back to two things. I remember in algebra, I took algebra and someone said two X equals eight, X equals four. And I just couldn't wrap my, I didn't, I just didn't understand it. You are not a math person. And Arden said, you don't have to understand it. It's just X equals four. And I couldn't understand it. Well, the same applied to the news story I did yesterday. I still don't fully understand what I reported, but it was basically a... Uh, an issue I'm not going to get into about swapping land here in Surfside. Okay, but I, I really all right, I'll graduate. explain it to you afterwards. Could, did you understand my story? Yes, I, I, I videotaped it. But do you understand? Because I really <laughs> Okay, understand. very funny. I'm very not funny. joking, I'm not joking. Last question. No, but do you understand? This is very exciting about uh, what, why, why does it take a year for the... It's not that like, okay, I give you a year, Earth, to go around the sun. Right. It's I give you... Whatever it takes the earth to go around the sun, that's what we'll call a year. <laughs> okay, on to the next question. While you're talking about that, the only thought in my head is that you could literally die at any moment. Yes, you can. That option is always open to us. Last question. Why do chickens have eggs instead of real babies? Because there are different types That's of... That's from Z-Bugs. I know. She's brilliant about... She explained to me the electricity. Mm -hmm. the, did you hear that explanation? She, I swear, I said, where did you learn it? She learned it on some TV program. Yeah, they watch... Um, What do they watch? Story Bots. It's a good show. Story Bots. And that's where she learned. And she explained to me how it works. And and then she wanted to know when when you... How come you can have electricity and then not have electricity? And I said, give me a moment. I'll call you back. I said, the switch. By the way, both kids said that they were incredibly embarrassed that you showed up to their soccer. <laughs> embarrassed? I thought that they were, maybe yeah. Zizi was, but Zizi not was embarrassed. Really. They were happy, but they said when they were getting off the bus, someone said, someone's grandma's out there. And, <laughs> and I said, don't move. Like they had to freeze in the doorway. I picture. sent you the picture. It was a horrible picture, but I mean. 
I'm not a photographer. Mm -hmm. I'm a grandmother. They're cute kids. Carm, we made it to the end of episode, I believe, 33 or 34, but we're, uh, we're getting up there. We've got a call in 16 minutes. I want you focused for this call. Do you think that's possible? Look who is talking. You get, are the one who not is not anywhere. focused. We're I think you are on an overload. That's my diagnosis. We're, we're, we're not going anywhere. We are sitting in the car right here and doing this call. And I when am, it's done, I will I'm drop you off. I'm all for it. When it's done, I will drop you off. Okay. I, I enjoyed very much our interview because I think what is so beautiful to me personally is that's that a, this- I, That's a huge pet peeve of mine. It's redundant to me personally. If it wasn't you, it would, wouldn't be me. Me personally is redundant. <laughs> to me or personally? I agree with you. There is a little redundancy. But what, what was the beauty of it? I just, it was for emphasis. No, but what was the beauty of it? The, I forgot <laughs> now. Wait a second. The beauty. Brian Cuban's book, The Ambulance Chaser, is out. He was a sweet guy. I really liked him. No, it is coming out in December. Well, I'm going to pre order it. Pre-order. I'm going to pre order it. No, but what, what I. <clears throat> what I love is that he took a horrible life that he basically had. Mm-hmm. Maybe at some crazy times. No, he, had but a, he had a good life, but he had a lot of no, things no, no, going no, on. No, 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 no. It wasn't a good life because whenever he was happy and up, he was on something. Yeah. And did you, when you are on, up on something, you have to come off it, right? Yeah. But I think he took that horrible situation and now he's trying to help other people and he really uh, i read it in other places about him that he's really out there trying to be of help to others all right we'll be right back love you america what do you mean like, not like, right back we'll be back in a week or so oh god <laughs> see you america if we're still alive goodbye <laughs>